Welcome to Folklore on the Rocks. <laughs> All right. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Logan. I'm Lindsay. And this is Folklore on the Rocks. And today we are doing a reading of some traditional folklore stories. Yeah, some South African folklore. Yes. So our last creature feature is uh, is on the Groot slang. Mm-hmm. And he's a story from South Africa, the kind of jungles of the dark continent. And we kind of wanted to look at some other stories from that area. So, let's just jump right in. Uh, We are going to be just reading the original excerpts, uh, unabridged, uh, and we want you to make up your own mind about this. Uh, These aren't specifically pertaining to cryptids as much as just folklore, uh, but I want to kind of frame the the world that generated these, these monsters that we're looking at. So... Let's start with a story. Uh, the author of these, unfortunately, is unknown. Many of these were just kind of told through a verbal transmission passed down with each retelling. Um, but the first story is called Crocodile's Treason. Well, it is, it is from a book. It's, yes. it's a collected stories by a specific person. Oh, cool. Yeah, so the book is called South African Folk Tales, and it's by James A. Hone, M.G., um, and he just collected the tales. It was like 1910 when he published it. I did see that. And it was, yeah. I think, meant more as like a kid's book yeah, or something. A little bit. But I think that these tales will be good. They're they're very animistic. Uh, there's a lot of animal characters mm-hmm. in them and everything. Yeah, so. kind of like a Jungle Book or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Now, uh, before we begin our story, uh, we hope everyone's got a drink in front of you. Uh, Lindsay, what are you drinking? I am drinking that same thing, kind of, I was drinking with the Kurt Sling, the seltzer water. Okay. But it's alcoholic, and I've got a different flavor this time. It's a uh, grapefruit cardamom. Very nice. It's delicious. And as the day weathers on, I've shifted from the Bloody Mary up to uh, lemonade and high whisk whiskey. Uh, it's... And a local distillery, A too. local distillery, yeah, but it's a, it's a nice kind of rye whiskey mm-hmm. that just kind of works well when the the sun is overhead and that kind of seemed to work for south yeah. african stories high west is delicious if you've never had anything from there i highly recommend it good stuff yes all right well let's start off with our first story the crocodile's treason <clears throat> crocodile was in the days when all animals could still talk the acknowledged foreman of all water creatures and if one should judge from appearances one would say he still is But in those days it was his especial duty to have a general care of all water animals, and when one year it was exceedingly dry, and the water of the river where they had lived had dried up and become scarce, he was forced to make a plan to trek over to another river a short distance from there. He first sent Otter to spy. He stayed away two days and brought back a report that there was still good water in the other river. Real sea cow holes, and not even a drought of several years could dry up. After he inserted this, the crocodile called to his side tortoise and alligator. Look here, said he. I need you two tonight to carry a report to the lion. Say then to get ready. The veldt is dry and you will probably have to travel for a few days without any water. We must make peace with Lion and his subjects, otherwise we will utterly perish this year, and he must help us make the trek over to the other river, especially past the Boer's farm that lies in between, and to travel unmolested by any of the animals of the veldt, so long as the trek lasts. A fish on land is sometimes a very helpless thing, as you all know. The two had it mighty hard in the burning sun, and on the dry veldt, but eventually they reached Lion and handed him the treaty. Hmm, what is going on now? thought Lion to himself, when he had read it. I must consult Jackal first, said he. But to the commissioners, he gave back an answer that he would be the following evening with his advisers at the appointed place, at the big Varland willow tree, at the farther end of the hole of the water, where the crocodile had his headquarters. When tortoise and alligator came back, crocodile was exceedingly pleased with himself at the turn the case had taken. 
He allowed Otter and a few others to be present, and ordered them on that evening to have ready plenty of fish and other eatables for their guests under the Valo Willow. That evening, as it grew, Dark Lion appeared with Wolf, Jackal, Baboon, and a few other important animals at the appointed place, and they were received in the most open-hearted manner by Crocodile and the other water creatures. Crocodile was so glad at the meeting of the animals that he now and then let fall a great tear of joy that disappeared into the sand. After the other animals had done well by the fish, Crocodile laid bare to them the condition of affairs and opened up his plan. He wanted only to make peace among all animals, for they not only destroyed one another, but the Boer too would in time destroy them all. The Boer had already stationed at the source of the river no less than three pumps to irrigate his land and the water was becoming scarcer every day. More than this, he took advantage of their unfortunate position by making them sit in the shallow water, and then, one after the other, bringing about their death. As Lion was, on this account, inclined to make peace, it was his glory to take this opportunity to give his hand to these peacemaking water creatures and carry out this part of the contract, namely, escort them from the dried-up water, past the Boer's farm, and to the long sea-cow pools. "'And what benefit shall we receive from it?' asked the jackal. "'Well,' said Crocodile, "'the peace is made of great benefit to both sides. "'We will not exterminate each other. "'If you desire to come and drink water, "'you can do so with an easy mind, "'and not be the least bit nervous "'that I or any one of us will seize you by the nose.' and so also with all the other animals. And from your side, we are to be freed from Elephant, who has the habit, whenever he gets the opportunity, of tossing us with his trunk up into some open and narrow fork of a tree, and thereby allowing us to become Biltong. Lion and Jackal stepped aside to consult with one another, and then Lion wanted to know what form of security he would have that Crocodile would keep his part of the contract. I stake my word of honor, was the prompt answer from Crocodile, and he let loose a few more long tears of honesty into the sand. Baboon said that it was all square and honest from as much as he could see into the case. He thought it was nonsense to dig pitfalls for one another, because he was personally well aware that his race would benefit somewhat from this contract of peace and friendship. And more than this... They must consider that use must be made of the fast-disappearing water, for even in the best of times it was an unpleasant thing to always be carrying your life about in your hands. He would, however, like to suggest to the king that it would be well to have everything put down in writing, so that there would be nothing to regret in case it was needed. Jackal did not want to listen to the agreement. He could not see that it would benefit animals of the veldt, but Wolf who had fully satisfied himself with the fish, was in an exceptionally peace-loving mood, and he advised Lion to go ahead and close the agreement. After Lion had listened to all of his advisers, and also the pleading tones of Crocodile's followers, he held in forth a speech when he said that he was inclined to enter the agreement, seeing that it was clear that the Crocodile and his subjects were in a very tight place. There and then a document was drawn up, and it was resolved before midnight to begin the trek. Crocodile's messengers swam in all directions to summon together the water animals for the trek. Frogs croaked and crickets chirped in the long water grass. It was not long before all the animals had assembled at the Varland Willow. In the meantime, Lion had sent out a few dispatch riders to his subjects to raise a commando for an escort. And long ere midnight, these were also at the Varland Hollow in the moonlight. The trek was then regulated by Lion and Jackal. Jackal was to take the lead and act as spy. And when he was able to draw Lion to one side, he said to him, See here, I do not trust this affair one bit, and I will tell you straight out, I am going to make tracks. I will spy for you until you reach the sea cow pool, but I am not going to be the one to await your arrival there. Elephant had to act as advance guard because he could walk so softly and yet hear and smell so well. Then came Lion with one division of the animals, then Crocodile's trek, with a flank protection on both sides. The wolf received orders to bring up the rear. 
Meanwhile, while this was all being arranged, Crocodile was smoothly preparing his treason. He called Yellow Snake to one side and said, It is to our advantage to have these animals, who go among us every day, and who will continue to do so, fall into the hands of the boa. Listen now, you remain behind, unnoticed, and when you hear me shout, you will know that we have arrived safely at the sea cow pool. Then you must harass the boa's dogs as much as you can and the rest will look out for themselves. Thereupon, the trek moved on. It was necessary to go very slowly, as many of the water animals were not accustomed to journey on land. But they trekked past the Bower's farm in safety, and toward break of day they were all safely at the sea cow pool. There, most of the water animals disappeared suddenly into the deep water, and Crocodile also began to make preparations to follow their example. With tearful eyes, he said to Lion that he was oh so thankful for the help, that from pure relief and joy he must first give vent to his feelings by a few screams. Thereupon he suited his words to actions, and that even the mountains echoed, and then thanked Lion on behalf of his subjects, and purposely continued with a long speech, dwelling on all the benefits of both sides that would derive from this agreement of peace. Lion was about to say good day and take his departure, when the first shot fell, and with it, Elephant and a few other animals. I told you so, shouted Jackal from the other side of the sea cow pool. Why did you allow yourselves to be misled by a few crocodile tears? Crocodile had disappeared long ago into the water. All one saw was just a lot of bubbles. And on the banks, there was an actual war against the animals. It simply crackled the way the Boers shot them. But most of them, fortunately, came out of it alive. Shortly after, they say, Crocodile received his well-earned reward when he met a driver with a load of dynamite. And even now, when the elephant gets a chance, he pitches them up into the highest forks of the trees. <laughs> yeah, that, that wily old crocodile. Yeah. I mean... Treason is an interesting thing. It, it is. Uh, it's the designed, uh, well, going against really your friends. Yeah. Uh, this felt very much like the Red Wedding from Game of Thrones. <laughs> uh, when the crocodile brings everyone in for, uh, yes, I am your friend. Yeah, let's make a deal. Let's Spoilers, decide. Logan. You know, yeah, yeah, okay. So... <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> if, you're, if you're three seasons behind on Game of Thrones... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um... But yeah, absolutely. You could keep talking about Red Wedding. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. yeah no, no, no. Too. That's kind of all I really had. Um, but it is a universal experience that uh, you like to think you can trust your friends, but some, if they're crocodiles, watch out. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's a good lesson that not everyone has the intention that they say they have. Yeah. Right. So what, watch your back. Um Think about people's motives. I feel like that's part of the um, attributes assigned to the water creatures. Mm -hmm. Most of them live under the surface. You don't get to see them all the time. They're unknowns. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. many of them, if in the case like a, like a crocodile or, or even the alligator, they prey upon land animals by way of ambush. Yeah, it's, unsuspecting victims. Yeah. No, it makes a lot of sense. I do think an aspect of this that's interesting is kind of taking the anthropomorphizing out of it mm -hmm. and thinking about these two groups of people, the water animals and the land animals, as like maybe a village or maybe two, two different tribes or something yeah. like that. <laughs> and they're both working together to get rid of some threat or to bypass some threat like the Boers are in this. Because treason is a very human yeah. thing, uh, at least in concept, right? I mean, sure, there's instances of treason in the animal world, but the higher thinking that we tend to have leads to things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to think about it as groups of humans rather than groups of animals, which I think that is that's kind of the idea oh, yeah. of the story, right? It's a it's a parable. I think another aspect of this is, you know, 
Jackal figured it out. <laughs> he knew yeah, what yeah, was I up. Yeah, I did notice that. He was definitely the one that uh, that tried to warn the lion. Mm-hmm. And that is an interesting character to include. Yeah, especially with the Jackal himself, right? Yeah, usually he's, the Jackal is not a good thing. He's um, kind of an unreliable character. Yeah. But in this instance, he he knew, or at least his gut feeling was right. And I think that's part of the message of this, you know, trust your gut, trust past experiences you've had with these other people. I mean, people don't change that much. They really don't Mm -hmm. just by nature. I'm more or less the same as I was when I was eight years old. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) I can see that. Yeah. Just a little bit more grown up. A little bit. A little bit. So by nature, the kind of person that you were when you were eight is the kind of person you are now. Sure. Right. So if you are good and not the kind of person that, you know, grabs favors from someone and then commits treason against them, like the crocodile, yeah, that's going to be evident to people that know you. Right. And mm-hmm. um, you won't have changed in that aspect. If you find somebody that's super manipulative at a young age you beat them 20 years later, they're still going to be super manipulative. Yeah, they're going to find what works and just keep on yeah. doing it. Yeah. So trust your gut, trust the past, trust your experiences. Um, I think that, that that is probably one of the main things to take from this story. Mm-hmm. What, what did you think? Well, yeah, I think, I think you're right. Trust your gut. Uh, don't trust people you shouldn't. That's a big part of it. Also... When when a deal seems too good to be true, uh, really... It probably is. Yeah, yeah. It, think of yourself in the position of the lion. Well, yeah, they, they need water. But that's something that they've been doing for generations. They get around it. They find times yeah, when the crocodile's changed? not there. So for the crocodile to say, we need this just one time and you will continue to reap the benefits forever. Well, look at that a little closer. Mm-hmm. And it's their main food source, right? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous of the lion to actually believe that these creatures are going to leave them alone. Yeah. They got to eat. (laughs) I did like the kind of, I don't know, in my mind, it's a composited from some Noah's Ark made for TV movie of the animals moving on their big trek. Yeah. The I can just I just imagine these little flappy fish yeah, the, for the, hours out of water. <laughs> just kind of flopping along uh like an inchworm meets a kickflip. Uh <laughs> either that or they ride on the back of some other great animal. It must be. Yeah. Like the tortoise or something. Mm-hmm. But the whole the whole uh the menagerie was there. They mm-hmm. they got them all in there. Well, cool. Well, that's uh, that's the Crocodile's Treason. I hope you folks enjoyed it. If you have any comments, go ahead and email us. Um, let's move on to our next story. And this is from the same anthology collection. Uh, this one's called The Monkey's Fiddle, and it's a, it's a fun one. <clears throat> Hunger and want forced Monkey one day to forsake his lands and to seek elsewhere among strangers for much-needed work. Bulbs, earth beans, scorpions, insects, and other such things were completely exhausted in his own land. But fortunately, he received, for the time being, shelter with a great uncle as his, Orang Yutang, which lived in another part of the country. When he had worked for quite a while, he wanted to return home, and as recompense, his great uncle gave him a fiddle and a bow and arrow, and told him that with the bow and arrow he could hit and kill anything he desired and with the fiddle he could force anything to dance. The first he met upon his return to his own land was Br'er Wolf. This old fellow told him all the news, and also that since early morning he had been attempting to stalk a deer, but all in vain. Then Monkey laid before him all of the wonders of the bow and arrow which he carried on his back, and assured him that if he could but see the deer, he could bring it down for him. When Wolf showed him the deer, Monkey was ready, and down fell the deer. They made a good meal together, but instead of Wolf being thankful, jealousy overmastered him, and he begged for the bow and arrow. When Monkey refused to give it to him, he thereupon began to threaten him with his greater strength. So when the jackal passed by, Wolf told him Monkey had stolen his bow and arrow. After Jackal had heard both of them, he declared himself unqualified to settle the case alone, 
and proposed that they bring the matter to the court of the lion, tiger, and the other animals. In the meantime, he declared he would take possession of what had been the case of their quarrel, so that it would be safe, he said. But he immediately brought to earth all that was eatable, so that there was a long time of slaughter before Monkey and Wolf agreed to have their affair in court. Monkey's evidence was weak, and to make it worse, Jackal's testimony was against him. Jackal thought that in this way it would be easier to obtain the bow and arrow from Wolf for himself. And so fell the sentence against Monkey. Theft was looked upon as a great wrong. He must hang. The fiddle was still at his side, and he received as a last favor from the court the right to play a tune on it. He was a master player of his time, and in addition to this came the wonderful power of his charmed fiddle. Thus, when he struck the first note of cock crow upon it, the court began at once to show an unusual and spontaneous liveliness. And before he came to the first waltzing turn of the old tune, the whole court was dancing like a whirlwind. Over and over, quicker and quicker, sounded the tune of cockrow on the charmed fiddle, until some of the dancers, exhausted, fell down, although still keeping their feet in motion. But Monkey, musician that he was, heard and saw nothing of what happened around him. With his head placed lovingly against the instrument and his eyes half closed, he played on, keeping time ever with his foot. Wolf was the first to cry out in pleading tones breathlessly, <laughs> Please stop, Cousin Monkey! For love's sake, please stop! But Monkey did not even hear him. Over and over sounded the restless walt of Cockcrow. After a while, Lion showed sign of fatigue. And when he had gone the round once more with his young lion wife, he growled as he passed Monkey, My whole kingdom is yours, ape, if you would just stop playing. I do not want it, answered Monkey. But withdraw the sentence and give me my bow and arrow, and you, Wolf, acknowledge that you stole it from me. I acknowledge, I acknowledge, cried Wolf while Lion cried at that same instance that he withdrew the sentence. Monkey gave them a few more turns of the cock crow, gathered up his bow and arrow, and seated himself in the highest camelthorn tree. The court and other animals were so afraid that he might begin again that they hastily disbanded to the new parts of the world. Cool. And that's the end. I, I was... Taking notes as I was reading through it, uh, I did notice that the tiger was included into that. Yeah, it's a change from the previous story. Yeah, well, uh, tigers don't live in Africa, and interesting. So it you get, but often they're more Asian. Yeah, yeah, and, and often you get thinking, you know, lions and tigers and bears. They all get grouped up into wild animals. It's very, very common for the tiger to be included among the collection of African animals. Mm -hmm. But I was going to get a little critical, but then they factored it in when they said, oh, well, they all went off to different parts of the world. True. So there goes the tiger. <laughs> there went my soapbox. <laughs> yes. So I think this is interesting. Um, this whole tale of his he said, she said thing. The fact that his fiddle was stolen and then claimed to have been stolen by him, you know, the unjustness of that. And I think that's a very prevalent thing all over the world. You know, someone can claim something that's not true. And then based on other people's preconceptions, someone judges something to be true one way or not. And whether it's correct is negligible. Yeah, you know? yeah, it's in that gray area somewhere in between. Exactly. And with the monkey, it seems to be the case. Yeah, and and I feel that he was exceptionally justified in its reaction yeah. to this. He was giving these amazing magical items and someone's taking them away from him and then then blaming him and potentially leading him to execution <laughs> for someone else stealing his stuff, you know? And I think, I think, I don't want to get too political, but that's definitely kind of a commentary on anyone's justice For system. For sure. You know, I mean, the wrong calls are made all of the time. Mm -hmm. And some of the right ones, sure. I think it's a good example of overcoming that issue, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Getting your vengeance a little bit 
And I like that it wasn't in a horrifically violent way. I like that too. You know, he he kind of tricked them into dancing and dancing until they couldn't take it anymore. And well, that's I mean, I guess a form of torture mm-hmm. a little. It's also at the same time not as violent as it could be. Yeah, he could have killed them and eaten them and uh, mm-hmm. and done all kinds of terrible. Yeah, but other that's things. monkey. Of course, he's not going to. Right? Yeah. I did think it also interesting, um, by the same note of the tiger living someplace else in the real world, so does the orangutan. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, That's Asia, too. Yeah. Right? Indonesia, I think. Indonesia, Borneo. Um, And so this tells me this is more a story that was put together after the fact. Yeah, that does make sense. Mm Mm-hmm. But it also does kind of work with the narrative of the story. It doesn't matter. The age of the story doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, it, it still works. The monkey's cousin is the orangutan, and he probably has wisdom to teach him. So mm-hmm. uh, I'm not sure he could make a bow that would hit anything or a fiddle <laughs> that'll force you to dance. But You have to have magical items. Yeah, it's part of any good journey. Exactly. <laughs> um, but I, I do think that it was definitely an interesting commentary. Yeah. For sure. Cool. All right, let's move on to our final story. This one is called The Story of a Dam. Now, it's it, this is not the typical dam that one gives, uh, you know. <laughs> or not, doesn't or give. Or not gives, yes. I sell my <laughs> give a dam uh, for a living. And this is a dam for the water. D-A-M. D-A-M. All right, off we go. There was a great drought in the land. And Lion called together a number of animals, so that they might devise a plan for retaining water when the rains fell. The animals which attended at Lion's summons were Baboon, Leopard, Hyena, Jackal, Hare, and Mountain Tortoise. It was agreed they should scratch a large hole in some suitable place to hold water, and that the next day they should all begin work, with the exception of Jackal, who continually hovered about in that locality and was overheard to mutter that he was not going to scratch his nails off in making water holes. When the dam was finished, the rains fell, and it was soon filled with water, to the great delight of those who had worked so hard for it. The first one, however, to come and drink there was Jackal, who not only drank, but filled his clay pot with water, then proceeded to swim out in the rest of the water, making it as muddy and dirty as he could. This was brought to the knowledge of Lion, who became very angry and ordered Baboon to guard the water the next day, armed with a huge knob curry. Baboon was concealed in a bush close to the water, but Jackal soon became aware of his presence there and guessed its cause. Knowing the fondness of Baboons for honey, Jackal at once hit upon a plan, and marching to and fro, every now and then dipped his fingers into his clay pot and licked them with an expression of intense relish, saying in a low voice to himself, "Hmm, I don't want any of their dirty water when I have a pot full of delicious honey. This was too much for poor Baboon, whose mouth began to water. He soon began to beg Jackal to give him a little honey, as he had been watching for several hours and was very hungry and tired. After taking no notice of Baboon at first, Jackal looked around and said in a patronizing manner that he pitied such an unfortunate creature and would give him some honey on certain conditions, viz. that Baboon should give up his knob curry and allow himself to be bound by Jackal. He foolishly agreed and was soon tied in such a manner that he could not move hand or foot. Jackal now proceeded to drink the water, to fill his pot, and to swim in the sight of Baboon, from time to time telling him what a foolish fellow he had been to so easily have been duped, that he, the Jackal, had no honey or anything else to give him, excepting a good blow on the head every now and again with his own knob curry. The animals soon appeared, and found poor Baboon in this sorry plight, looking the very picture of misery. Lion was so exasperated that he caused Baboon to be severely punished and to be denounced as a fool. Tortoise hereupon stepped forward and offered his services for the capture of Jackal. It was at first thought that he was merely joking, but when he explained in what manner he proposed to catch him, his plan was considered to be so feasible that his offer was accepted. He proposed a thick coating of Bijinberg, 
which is a kind of sticky black substance found on beehives, should be spread all over him, and that he should then go and stand at the entrance of the dam, on the water level, so that the jackal might tread upon him and stick fast. This was accordingly done, and Tortoise posted there. The next day, when Jackal came, he approached the water very cautiously, and wondered to find no one there. He then ventured to the entrance of the water, and remarked how kind they had been in placing a single black stepping stone for him. As soon, however, as he trod upon the supposed stone, he stuck fast, and saw that he had been tricked, for Tortoise had now put his head out and began to move. Jackal's hind feet still being free, he threatened to smash Tortoise with them if he did not let go. Tortoise merely answered, Do as you like. Jackal thereupon made a violent jump and found with horror that his hind feet were also now stuck fast. Tortoise, said he, I still have my mouth and teeth left, and I will eat you alive if you do not let me go. Do as you like, Tortoise again replied. Jackal, in his endeavors to free himself, at last made a desperate bite at Tortoise, and found himself fixed both at the head and feet. Tortoise, feeling proud of his successful capture, now marched quietly up to the top of the bank with Jackal on his back, so that he could easily be seen by the animals that they came to the water. They were indeed astonished to find how cleverly the crafty Jackal had been caught, and Tortoise was much praised, while the unhappy baboon was again reminded of his misconduct when set to guard the water. Jackal was at once condemned to death by the lion, and Hyena was to execute the sentence. Jackal pleaded hard for mercy, but finding this was useless, he made his last request to Lion. Always, as he said, so fair and just in his dealings, that he should not have to suffer a long and lingering death. Lion inquired of him in what manner he wished to die and he asked that his tail might be shaved and rubbed with a little fat, and that Hyena would then swing him around twice and dash his brains out upon a stone. This, being considered sufficiently fair by Lion, was ordered to him to be carried out in his presence. When Jackal's tail had been shaved and greased, Hyena caught hold of him with great force, and before he had fairly lifted him off the ground, the cunning Jackal had slipped away from the Hyena's grasp and was running for his life, pursued by all the animals. Lion was the foremost pursuer, and after a great chase, Jackal got under an overhanging precipice, and standing on his hind legs with his shoulders pressed against the rock, called loudly to Lion to help him, as the rock was falling and would surely crush them both. Lion put his shoulders to the rock, and exerted himself to the utmost. After some time, Jackal proposed that they could both creep slowly out, and fetch a large pole to prop up the rock, so that the lion could get out and save his life. Jackal did creep out, and left lion there to starve and die. The end. Started off with a story of a dam and... Damn, damn is what I have to say about that. That is cold. Yeah. Now, the jackal. jackal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He is traditionally kind of a rat bastard. And he's been in all three of our stories today, mm-hmm. actually. Yeah, and I, I would like to touch a little bit. Uh, jackals, wolves, anything that occupies the same ecological niche as humans, mm-hmm. very, very commonly gets portrayed as a, as really the, a villain in these stories. Yeah. Trick, um, tricky. Tricky. Trickster. Yeah, and selfish and really... Uh, just all of these bad, bad things that, that no person should ever be to another. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, the lion at least has some redeeming He's factors. noble and Yeah, they move in prides. They look really great. Fair and just, apparently. Yeah. So I do like some of the anthropomorphization that is going on here. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, I don't believe that jackals in real life should be you know, persecuted for... <laughs> They're just animals. <laughs> being in a, just a scavengers of their, of their own ecosystem. They are a device to use as a character that a human might be. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, if you call somebody, oh, you filthy jackal, it's, it's not a great thing to say. <laughs> Son of a jackal. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Good old uh, Aladdin night right there. I mean, for a while in this story, I was really excited about the tortoise being the badass. I know. I love. <laughs> I love the tortoise. He just he comes in slowly with a good plan in his head. Because I mean, I feel him. Yeah. Tortoise and I were we're on the same level. I did note that uh, for some reason the tortoise was in the water, though. Yeah, the tortoise is all the land one, right? Indeed, that's why they have turtles, feet instead of flippers. Yeah, turtles are the ones that swim, but I think tortoise a tortoise can be both land and water. Yeah, from what I know, but which isn't a lot. <laughs> but that being said, it's it's a fun fairy tale. Yeah, the animals yeah. can talk and the tortoise can swim, but I do think it was a really good one. I really like that one. Definitely. I mean, um. As with all of these, it's so easy to be able to place humans in these same spots, right? Oh, like it's for sure. really, really easy to see how it moves over yeah. into humans, right? Some guy didn't do his job, like just like the baboon, and got walked all over. Yeah, yeah. I do think it is of note that uh, the guard animals use weapons. Mm-hmm. I should look up what that is. Yeah. And. and <laughs> But those tools of, of human people, uh, that's kind of a, it leads me again to think that it is uh, a direct uh, simile, allegory, metaphor, however you want to take it. Uh, these, this is meant to be a representational story. Okay. So apparently a knob carry is a short stick with a knobbed head traditionally used as a weapon by the indigenous peoples of South Africa. Cool. So it's basically a long stick with... A big old knob on the head. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe like Rafiki. Ah, maybe. Yep. That's, Although he's a mandrill. I'm. I'm. That's all that's in my brain for right now. Uh, <laughs> yep. <laughs> but I imagine. I imagine Baboon using it in much the same way. Yep. That we see Rafiki. <laughs> a good bonk on the head just to give you a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Interesting. Well, perhaps I should have one at work. <laughs> that would be nice. I have l- my- Actually, that would be exceptionally dangerous yeah because i would feel the need to use it maybe on basically everyone (laughs) yeah we uh, which is sad because i work from home (laughs) so it really (laughs) wouldn't work (laughs) yeah but there is whatever your work situation there is wisdom to be taken from these old stories oh absolutely you know i think god the story is it's tragic really it is uh this is a a story that the good guy does not win the good well even then, um, the medium guy wins. The medium guys wins, but the the, the heroes of the story, those that prepared and just wanted to live their life, the the innocence of the story, they are spared. Uh, the mm-hmm. dam got built. The water was there. It's just muddy. Just muddy. Just that jackal. That jackass jackal. Yeah. In the story, he gets all the water. He did get his sha- his tail shaved though. He's got uh, he's got his tail shaved and what an image. greased up. <laughs> Can't hang on to that tail. No good for nothing. Yeah. It surprises me that I didn't see right through that. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, he's a clever one. Yes. Tricky, tricky, tricky. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's our uh, our little folk stories from South Africa. Uh, thank you so much for listening to them. I hope you had a good time. If you got any comments, questions, if you can find a different version of these stories that maybe means something different, we'd love to hear it. Even just your thoughts on the stories themselves would be... It's great fun. You know, tweet us, email us, either. Um, you can find us both on Instagram and Facebook at Folklore on the Rocks. We are at Twitter at, at Folklore Rocks. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also have pictures, notes, sources on our website at FolkloreOnTheRocks.com. Um, we do have a Patreon that if you want to contribute, fantastic if you don't want to that's also totally fine Mm -hmm. um we we additionally have a donate button on our website if you just want to make a one-time contribution because you like what we do um it just helps us with hosting costs and editing costs and um new equipment that kind of thing we do have a merch shop that we want to launch pretty soon and we're gonna get some cool stuff in there it's gonna be awesome you know it might it might end up be Logan and I buying just everything, <laughs> but um, it will, it'll be a permanent installation. So you'll, you should be able to buy merch whenever you want, if you do. Yeah. Um, and we do have a pretty kick-ass logo. So 
I can't imagine why you wouldn't want it on something. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> also, if you got any any personal stories about like a creature or a monster or potentially even a cryptid that you've encountered, you may not even like if you don't even know what it was, that's totally fine still too. Go ahead and email those to stories at folkloreontherocks.com. Uh, we really want to kind of gather enough to do a listener's episode. Yeah, I that'd think. Be, I that'd be really, really, really cool. I, I really like that idea. Yeah. So, and um, we also encourage any questions or comments from you guys. If you've got feedback, that's awesome. You know, we want this to be as much your show as it is ours. Um, so you can email those to mail at folkloreontherocks.com. We also ask that if you have the time to please rate us and give us a review on iTunes, it really helps. We're starting out, as you know, and I think that um, those would be really, really helpful for us in reaching more listeners. Yeah. Um, once we hit 100 reviews, we are, are going to do a bonus episode, and we want that to be a listener-selected creature. Um, my guess is how we're going to do that is probably via a poll like on Twitter or something. Mm -hmm. Um, And along that line, you're also welcome to send any suggestions that you'd like via Twitter or email to us. I think suggestions at folkloreontherocks.com is also an email that we have. So tell your friends. Yes, please. Get the word out. Word of mouth is the best possible thing that you could do for us. One of the neat things about our our little show here is that we specifically try to shine light on stories that haven't been told in a while, especially Mm -hmm. in a podcast format. So if you've got something that you think, oh man, no one ever tells this story. They always cover all of the other ones. Well, we are your friends, ladies and gentlemen. Submit those to us and we would be happy to read them. Go nuts, really. (laughs) If you want me to do funny voices, let's do some funny voices. But uh, until then, I really hope you enjoyed listening to this story. I hope you got something from it. Um, And maybe if you've got somebody in your life and the opportunity to tell a story, this might be one you think of. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for listening to us. And uh, we'll see you next Sunday. Yeah. Thanks again. Cheers. Cheers.